It's a distinct pleasure to be here, and, and I'm a chancellor at a university, so I spend a lot of time, uh, a lot of days at convocation. And it is absolutely my favorite uh, time of, of the whole year because it's a special moment. It's an incredible moment in your lives. You will always remember who you sat next to and all those pictures and videos that you're starring in today. Well, just wait a few years. When you look back, there will be a little shudder down your spine, and you'll say, what was I thinking? And who was that guy? What's with the haircut or the shoes? <laughs> There'll definitely be some blackmail material in there. <laughs> in 10 years, maybe 20, a familiar face or an old song or something will spark a feeling or a memory about this time. Perhaps about a true love or a broken heart, Perhaps about a what if, or a belief that you hold with such conviction today that by then you won't be able to figure out what took you so long to change your mind. Maybe you'll think back to the dream you have today, your plan for the future, and judge how much you've accomplished since. In the world that I live in, the public world, I'm considered a successful person because of the many years that I spent on television. Too often in our society, we equate fame or success. But the real success in life, and you come to know this over time, your real success at work and your relationships is actually a result of the expectation of it. By you of yourself, by others of you, teachers, bosses, <coughs> friends, but most particularly, the expectation of your family. Their confidence in you, in us, allows us to bridge the gap between our aspirations and our achievements. So I have come to judge my success by the company I keep. And I think when you look around the room today, at your friends and at your family and those that have supported you, you can judge your own success. And you've probably done so well. Give them a round of applause. of the people in the place we call home because family and community shape our attitudes, they help us craft our value systems, our families are our first mentors, because it is from family and community that you learn that first sense of the importance of keeping attuned to your own moral compass. And having that compass set is what allows us to have, through tough times, the courage of our convictions. I am so thankful to have grown up in a home where my mother, the English teacher, taught me to speak my mind, but only once that mind was informed. And where my, and it's some days you have to bite your tongue, believe me. And where my father taught me how to inform myself. He always said, and we didn't have Google or any of those things then, we had a set of Encyclopedia Britannica in the corner. And whenever I'd ask him a question about, you know, what's the capital of Canada or whatever the, it might be, he'd say, go look it up. And when you have the answer, then we'll talk about it. So he actually taught me how to think and use my own judgment. Skills that I use every single day in the various different things I've done. But the single most important lesson that my mother and father taught me, and it was not by lecture, or word is by, by example, is simply this, that character trumps genius. You can be the smartest person in the room or on the platform, but if you are not kind, if you are not decent, if you are not fair, if you are not generous when it's difficult to do so, then all the brains in the world are for naught. These lessons are important ones. Your compassion, your concern, your instinct, your intuition, as well as your education, hard-earned today. These will prove to be the most valuable tools in separating the interesting from the important in life. Lots of things titillate us and amuse us. We have to separate that from what's important and what matters. In understanding why things happen, learning from that, reacting to it, because that's what makes us a caring citizen, a participant and not just a bystander. For the last few years as students, you have been observers in a way. You've been busy, as all have mentioned, learning your theories, studying at night, keeping those late hours. But today you graduate, 
from observer to participant, and you are about to discover the wonderful burden of choice. That what you do matters, and not just to you. Your actions, your choices, will always have consequences, good or bad, some intended, some not. <coughs> so each choice you make in life has to become a conscious choice. Your gut, your intuition, your instinct, and your education will help you make some smart ones. Learning is not about knowing for knowing's sake. It is, in the end, knowing so that you can make a difference in your world. You will only make that difference if you learn that along with all the rights and privileges you have, and they are many in this incredible country, that there are also responsibilities to you, to your community, to your family, and to your country. Not just responsibilities that will come to you with your jobs or the work that you choose, but your responsibility to contribute to your fellow citizens. When I meet the young men and women who spend their day to day in Afghanistan, many who are just your age, many who have volunteered for military service, putting their lives at risk so that we don't have to, to protect our rights so that we don't have to fight those fights again. It sets an example. You've got to involve yourself in your community, contribute to your environment, spend time with the elderly. Perhaps you're going to spend some time helping tears <coughs> in trouble. Because it really is always about paying it forward. And it'll come back to you tenfold. Someone once said that everybody's life is really lived as a series of conversations, all those things, exchanges that we have with each other each and every day. For me, actually, that's quite literally true because I've had thousands of these exchanges and conversations and many of them in front of television, cameras, on the screens. We know, though, that from our own lives, relationships are the most important thing. The relationships that you establish every time you have one of those conversations, every time you have a shared experience, every time you have a crisis or a problem and you reach out to someone. But relationships need maintenance, and the most important tool in any relationship is the ability to hear, to actually listen and hear what is being said by the other. The actor Alan Alda once said that listening is the ability to be changed by the other. And that is certainly how we learn. That's certainly what you've been through for the last few years. And for many of those conversations that I was fortunate enough to have on, on screens in the glare of the lights, I gleaned some, I think, important insight about curiosity and about generosity of the human spirit. We all have our flaws and our failures. Those things teach us lessons too. And crisis often helps us to find character. But in these conversations, I've learned so many things. I once asked Rick Hansen, and many of you will remember him as the man in motion in a wheelchair going across the country, in fact, around the world. I asked him that given what he knows today about his life, his life in a wheelchair, if he had it to do over again, would he get into the back of that truck with a drunk driver at the wheel? He didn't even pause. His answer was yes. Why is that? Because he said tragedy forced him to dig deep. We are a combination of what we're born with and the things that happen to us, our environment and the choices we make, he explained. I wouldn't have had the opportunity to find out who I was this hasn't happened. Curious creatures we are indeed.